That sounds great. Well, good evening, everyone. It's 7.32 on Monday, February 8th, 2021. And this is the Wilmette Park District regular meeting of the Board of Park Commissioners. Uh, we'll start off with a uh, roll call, please, Steve. Commissioner Abbott? On your, yep, yes, I'm here. Commissioner Murdoch? Here. Commissioner Schistler? Here. Commissioner Clark? Here. Commissioner Wolf? Here. Commissioner Goebel? Here. Commissioner Anderson? Here. You have a quorum. All right, we need somebody to mute, please. I muted him. Oh, thank you. All righty, next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from January 11th. Um, it was a regular meeting and the public hearing related to the, uh, the 2021 budget. Um, can I get a motion to approve? Uh, so moved. Moved. Second. Thank you. Any questions, comments, edits, corrections? I appreciate these coming out ahead of time uh, and uh, for, for review, that's been nice. I and I take that as no, no edit, no further edits. No further edits for me. All right, Steve. Commissioner Any Abbott. Honors? Yes. Commissioner Murdoch. Yes. Commissioner Schistler. Yes. Commissioner Clark. Yes. Commissioner Clark. Yes. Uh, yes. Commissioner yes. Wolf. Yes. Commissioner Goble. Yes. Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Minutes are approved. Excellent. Now we move on to communications and correspondence, of which there was uh, quite a bit this, uh, this time around. In the packet, there was at least a dozen emails uh, supportive of disc golf in general, and in many cases, specifically at Gilson Park. And, uh, and then I think I saw uh, later today, a whole bunch of emails were coming through from people uh, that didn't make the packet, obviously, but came through today um, that related to disc golf both for and against, uh, including people who've actually moved out of town and heard we were thinking about it and, and, and followed back up again. Uh, and in addition, we had the email from uh, Dale Green on the Gilson Park Comprehensive Plan. Anybody else have anything more than that? No, I would just like to make a brief comment about the disc golf conversation. Julie and I have been communicating a little bit and um, I don't want to speak for her. Maybe she can chime in as well, but um, I know that the conversation seems to be focused on whether there should be disc golf at Gilson. I think the question should be, should there be disc golf? And if we decide, then we should look at locations. There may be other locations. I remember when I was young playing at Gilson, and so I certainly enjoyed it, but I know that there were some challenges, and I can understand why people have focused on Gilson. We're doing a master plan, and it was there before but it seems to me that we're sort of getting the cart ahead of the horse with this one. And, you know, at the Parks and Rec Committee meeting, I've been talking for some time about the need for maybe some system-wide comprehensive planning. I think this is a good example why, but perhaps we could direct folks who are interested in that to another process so it's not focused strictly on Gilson. That's right. And I think I'll, I'll elaborate from there. You know, one of the things we see this year in the last 12 months, for example, as we've all been home, is that there's a really high level of engagement in our community uh, in, a, in a great way. I think it's evidenced in a few places. One is, um, you know, the number of conversations we have with respect to the different amenities that are available in our community, but also um, even just in the number of candidates who are interested in joining the park board. So all of that is a really good thing. I think um, with respect to um, the disc golf, I, I used to live near a park that had disc golf in another community. Um, I would say it was a park district not as, as, um, as, as well run as ours, but um, it was certainly something that brought a lot of people and people really enjoyed it. Um, I, I think it's interesting to consider where, what are the uh, parks that could accommodate a, a, a sport like that? And that's why I initiated the conversation. But I, the other piece is, what are some other untapped ideas that we could bring together. You know, pickle, pickleball is expanding in a, the racket sport around the country. Where or is that right for our community? There's probably others that we might explore too. So it leads to the question of how do we best address and anticipate the needs of the community? Sometimes they come to us as in you know, with the, um, the frisbee golf idea, which I think is great, but um, good opportunity to take a step and look at all of the things we might be able to offer. I tend to, as a marketing executive, go to 
customer sentiment. What do our customers want? And then, you know, what are their unmet needs? But I'm confident we can figure out what makes sense. And it turns out that Frisbee is a great way to kick off that conversation. And Julia, if I could just jump back in, you mentioned pickleball specifically. That's been queued up at Parks and Rec. We're going to, at the next meeting, look at all the different parks where we might be able to offer it uh, with the goal of having a specific recommendation at the April Parks and Rec meeting. So we're moving on that as well. Thank you. Yeah. I would kind of, uh, I would agree with you on that. Uh, I think that it is um, a little bit of a cart before the horse thing. I think, you know, it's, it's a great idea. And I think that, um, the goal of us then would be to determine how feasible it is in, in the exact location. But uh, I love the ideas and um, I just don't want to get locked into only looking at it at one place. Yeah, and I think we've got the, uh, you know, we, we've reached out to the community and asked for their input on everything Gilson and we're getting lots of good, good input from lots of different places. And I just look at it as another piece of input, uh, like a lot of the other ones we're getting. And then sort of, it'll go in the mix and get talked about and the consultants will work with it and we'll work with it. And, and you know, it'll be, you know, obviously given our timing, a new board that'll probably make an end up making the final decision. But, but I think, you know, at this point, no decisions and certainly no decisions as to where have been made. Sure, I'll just, um... A little, a little, a uh, little conversations broken out here on disc golf, which is great. Uh, let me just weigh in. Uh, I took up uh, uh, as a as a pure amateur, my family and I took up disc golf this past summer. Went up to Glencoe. Uh, I thought it was terrific. I didn't, in many ways, uh, did it, it's a kind of a different sport than it went back when it was called frisbee. Uh, they use these much smaller discs, and uh, I thought it was a nice use of a park. Clearly, uh, we've been getting, uh, we're not done getting public comment uh, on, uh, on this issue. Uh, there seems to be two camps and sometimes they don't necessarily speak into the same issue. One camp that definitely wants disc golf, we're hearing that from the community. Many of them wanted it in Gilson, but at, at a minimum, they, there's definitely a movement uh, within the community for disc golf, we're hearing that. And there's definitely been some particularly neighbors, I'm oversimplifying, uh, that are concerned about it and having lived through the experience of, uh, of Frisbee golf, and I'm using that term uh, 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 deliberately, uh, Frisbee golf in uh, Gilson in the past uh, did not feel that they had a positive experience with it in the past. So uh, the master plan is not moving, not breaking any speeds, which is good because I'm going to drop in one of probably three reminders tonight that there's going to be a community meeting on February 18th, and we want you to attend that. Um, but we're not done with the master plan and we're not going to be done with the master plan. Um, we, well, we hope to complete it, you know, earlier ish this year, but, um, it's not going to be done anytime soon and there's no hurry. And, and, the, and for disc golf in Gilson, I think it should get a consideration from our, our designers, but so should just disc golf, uh, within the, uh, within uh, the park district. And so I certainly support what has, uh, but, but Mike and others and Julia and uh, others have said. So I think uh, it deserves our careful consideration. And I'd be for disc golf and I'd love to open up the conversation about location. Sorry, that was too long. Done. Anybody else before we move on to public comment and recognition of our visitors? Um, hi, everyone. It's uh, Christopher Lewis. I'm uh, we're not to uh, public comment yet, Mr. Lewis. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I thought we were. We're coming there soon. Hold on one okay. second. <laughs> Just keep me on your toes, Steve. <laughs> All right. I think we're at that point on the agenda, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Steve, you want to do All your... Right. Uh, um, we're going we're right to come right back to you, Chris. Uh, why don't you kick it off? Okay, so 30 seconds later. Um, I'm Christopher Lewis. Um, I live at 607 Washington in Wilmette and I'm a Sailing Beach member and relatively active down there. We're down there all the time. We've got uh, two or three boats down there and uh, summer times we live down there. Uh, the work that was done by the park district to open uh, the beach last summer uh, during COVID was fantastic. I wanna commend everyone for the work on that. Um, it was 
a sanctuary and anybody who does not go and, and spend time down there is missing out tremendously. Um, I would like to comment on the increase in fees that we've received on the beach. And I kind of feel they're a little bit out of proportion to what uh, we've had in the past. Um, we did, I did mention this in the Lakeview meeting, um, but the, um, the, to reiterate, our fees have typically gone up 3% a year, and this year they're going up between 6 and 8%. Um, I understand that uh, that is due to increased processing fees um, on the staff side, um, but I kind of feel that that's not something we should be held responsible for. That is a fee that is incurred by the park district. And typically those things are spread out and, and taken as an administrative fee, not directly transferred to the, the, uh, the membership fees. Um, the second thing I'd like to talk about is the increase in this new, a new partner fee that was added uh, this year. Um, we did get some clarifications on this at the lake uh, front meeting, but um, I'm confused about it still. Um, it's $120 across the board for everybody who has a partner on the beach. That represents a 23% to 36% increase in our fees this year. The explanation that I was given was that it's to compensate, to make things more equitable for partners because, um, I'm sorry, I'm getting a shake from Steve, but there's a, it's $120 um, that represents four people's access to the swimming beach if you have a partner. My concern with this is that it's a straight fee, but I know that there are partners, specifically I have a partner that does not have four people that are accessing the swimming beach. In fact, they only have two. And I know other people that have a, a spot on the beach that aren't having four people at the swing beach, they're only having a single person. So if this partner fee is a representation of the sail, the sailing members access to the swimming beach, I'd really prefer this thing to be pulled out and directly billed to make it as equitable as possible to actually represent the usage as opposed to a straight four person $30 fee for a partner. Um, I really like the park district to, to reapproach that. Now I understand that it's uh, geared for um, trying to make things a little bit more equitable. The thing that I'm confused about is that we don't have access to the discounted sail swimming beach and pool passes as sailing beach members. So if we are getting this, um, I'd like to have that reconsidered so that we can actually buy pool passes without paying the full fee. So if the park district could reevaluate these fee, these fees and actually make them reflective of reality, I would appreciate that. Great. Thank you. We, we're at three minutes. So, uh, go ahead. Pr President uh, 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 Anderson, I, I would like to just uh, make a comment to, uh, to Mr. Lewis, if that's okay. Um, hey, Brian, why don't, why don't we wait until everybody else is done and then, because there may be other people with similar comments. I'll, so I'll, I'll, I, and I only wish to add that uh, I, we'll bring this up. This topic will come up again in the Lakefront Committee meeting. Uh, oh, sure. So I will make at that point, we'll start to address Mr. Lewis's uh, request. Yeah, the, the, let's hear what everybody else has to say and perhaps there's something you want to say after that sure. before we do move on. Great. Uh, you want to go next? Next, I will. Uh, I see Walter Keats. All right. <clears throat> um, I had mentioned. Uh, uh, at the parks and recreation thing that at the, and at the end of your meeting you have the uh, capital expenditures budget and in there there's about eight uh, uh, things that are listed for security cameras for various parks and I don't remember seeing much discussion of it I, mean, I think it's all not a bad idea but one of the things that I think should be considered is not just security but the idea of data collection I mean look at usage uh, if you looked at the video that they took when they did the storm sewer thing in Community Playfield, they took a still picture every 15 minutes and it made a video. And so you could see usage uh, throughout the day and get some idea of, uh, uh, you know, whether people are doing it or not. Um, <clears throat> maybe there was some discussion and I just missed it about the actual security needs, but I noticed there's nothing there for the Community Playfield and probably a few others too. Now maybe that's going to come along, but 
uh, anyway, I just want to encourage that. Um, also, uh, the, the walk, bike, will met uh, master plan or whatever that's come out and going to be discussed later, I think it's this week or next week. Uh, it isn't clear to me what the park district if, is doing in, to coordinate with that. Uh, it would seem to me that they ought to be a, a big proponent of that. We're talking about disc uh, golf. Well, what about riding bikes? That's certainly recreation too, uh, and walking, these sorts of things. So anyway, I hope you guys are on top of that, but I just haven't seen it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, next, I see Isaac Gates. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for your time. Um, so I'm Isaac Gates. I'm at 531 Greenleaf. Uh, I guess I sort of started the disc golfing, so I really appreciate that, that you guys are giving it uh, consideration. Just um, a few thoughts on it. Um, I, do, I do appreciate the, the point about we should you know, take our time as far as picking a specific location and all that. That does make a lot of sense. But I would like to counter with a couple of thoughts that first, uh, I put a lot of thought into why I you know, sort of identified that particular area in the first place. There are only a handful of parks in Wilmette that I feel that even have just frankly just the space uh, to fit a, a reasonable sized disc golf course. So we're talking about three or four locations that could fit it. There's other smaller parks, but at that point, it'd be a, a very marginal course. Um, so it, it just to keep that in mind. Um, that particular area though is, is very favorable for disc golf. It has a lot of trees, which is good for that sport, but not necessarily very good for most other sports. Uh, and I understand having looked at the master plan that it doesn't seem to be any programmatic use of that particular area if Gilson, uh, and, and from my own experience, just going there, it, it doesn't get a whole lot of use. People tend to gravitate further into the park. I mean, they, if they're playing soccer, they're at the bigger field. Um, of course, if they're at the beach and all that. So, so that, there was a reason why I identified that. But um, another point would just be that uh, we don't want to get stuck into sort of a paralysis by analysis. We should take our time, think through things, but we are talking about maybe a $15,000 cost here. We're not talking about, you know, $500,000 or something that, you know, that obviously if we're, if we're building a new building or a giant new facility, we really have to take our time, run it through every possible process. And it's going to take, you know, five years to get done. This is just really the basic goals for a, a sport to utilize an area. It doesn't preclude other uses of the park or that particular part of the park. Uh, so for those reasons, I think, you know, we could probably find a, somewhere in between as far as how we move on this and not necessarily, you know, confine ourselves to, you know, taking just 18, 20 months or more. Um, I think all the, the positives of disc golf are fairly straightforward and obvious that, it, you know, it's a game that appeals to a lot of people. I was just on the lakefront uh, meeting last week and there was a couple who were there for to talk on what Chris Lewis was speaking about, but just having heard of the, for the first time, having heard of the mention of disc golf immediately spoke up in favor of it. So I think there's, latent interest. I've, you know, reached out on Nextdoor and found a few people that I, that I didn't know before that are also interested, but I'm sure if we actually publicize it, I think there'd be a flood of, of interest. There's, there's a lot of people that do want to play this and already play it and are just, you know, waiting to hear about it. So uh, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I see Kara Kozlaskis. Observing. Thank you. Thank you. Next, I see Rich DeLeo. Here to listen. Next, I see Andrew Levy. Here to listen, no comments at this time. Thank you. Next, I see Susie LaBelle. Just here to listen, thanks, Steve. Thank you. Uh, next, I see Allie Frazier. Also here to listen, thank you, Steve. Thank you. Next, Patrick's iPhone. Just here to listen, thank you. Next, Michael Doyle. Uh, no comments. Thanks, Steve. Uh, next, uh, Gary Knight. Gary Knight. You're unmuted now, Mr. Knight. Mr. Knight. Gary right. normally we'll to... comes to listen. So unless Great. you okay. allow him to 
burst back in later if he couldn't. You know, he wanted to have something to say, but he usually listens. Next, next, I see uh, Jeff Danielson. Hi, Steve. I just uh, wanted to put in a, a very quick word too to support the uh, the disc golf. Um, I too grew up in Wilmette and did play down at Gilson when we used to have the 18 hole course down there um, quite often with my dad and also remember the nine hole course that we had at a community play field. Um, since that time, just from a usage standpoint, community play field has exploded from when I was young as far as evening activities there. It used to be pretty, uh, you know, pretty vacant at that time. There were a couple baseball fields that were used during part of the year. Um, but you know, I, I don't see other options beyond Gilson, which is why I feel that this is a really strong proposal uh, from a space and usage standpoint. Great, thank you. Thank you. Next, I see Chris Krakowski. Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I am also Chris Krakowski um, at 910 Oakwood in Wilmette. Um, also here uh, to express support for the disc golf course. I play fairly often in neighboring communities, uh, Deerfield, Highland Park, Glenview, um, uh, Glencoe, obviously. All these seem to uh, have courses that uh, you know are pretty popular and do well, and I think that they've served a good role in those communities. Um, but yeah, I, I just wanted to hit a couple high points. You know, obviously they're very inexpensive on a relative basis, low maintenance, minimal space required. Um, and I think it would be a very great return um, uh, on an investment for, uh, for this community. Oh, great, yeah. thank you. Next I see iPhone. Steve, it's, uh, it's Rick Prohog again, is that, do you hear me? You are breaking up a little bit, but we hear you. I'll reserve comments to another night. I'm in the car now, but I'm listening. I'll, I'll just talk another day. Thank you. Uh, and next I see Mark Schumacher. Uh, observing tonight, thank you, Steve. Great, thank you. Commissioner Anderson, I believe that completes public comment. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian, did you want to say something real quick? To, to, to Chris? Commissioner Abbott, you're still muted. Of course I was. Seems. Uh, that's hard to mute me. Uh, yeah, just to, uh, we're going to talk about the fees at the lakefront discussion when we do uh, committee reports. That's all I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. All right, next on the list is the approval of the vouchers. Uh, can I get a motion to approve, please, and a second? I'll move. I move to approve the voucher list in the amount of $1,271,212.14, a copy of which is to be attached to and become a permanent part of the minutes of this meeting. I got that. Excellent. Any uh, questions for staff? I, I wanted to, sure, go, go ahead. I'll follow you. No, no, mine were minor and, and I got them answered earlier today and they're not worth the time of the board to, to follow up. Okay, thank you. I wanted to share one of the things that I'll bring up in a department, excuse me, a, a committee report coming up is some thoughts about the voucher list uh, presentment that have been uh, considered and we're going to be exploring in coming time. So I'll, I'll bring my comment to that part of the section. Anybody else? Steve, you want to take a vote, please? Sure. Commissioner yes. Abbott? Commissioner Murdoch? Unmuted, yes. Commissioner yes. Schistler? Commissioner yes. Clark? Yes. Commissioner Wolf? Yes. Commissioner Goble? Yes. Mr. Anderson? Voucher list is approved. Voucher list is approved. Okay, time for uh, the executive director's report. Great. Um, not a ton in my report, uh, but a couple big items. Uh, you have in your packet a resolution to approve under, I believe, new business. Uh, it's an amendment to the intergovernmental agreement with the village of Wilmette regarding stormwater uh, through the process 
of uh, review, it was to identify that there was a kind of a drafting error amongst the attorneys that did not reflect the intent of the two boards and uh, the amendment corrects that. And basically what the language in the initial uh, agreement was, you might recall, we asked the village to take that surface detention behind Highcrest and build a secondary vault underneath the surface of the ground. And um, that was to be in addition to the dollar amounts for the amenities for the three various parks. But the way it was written initially was that dollar amount minus the cost for the underground storage vault when it should have been plus the additional cost for the storage vault. So the, the village staff actually uh, identified it uh, and uh, uh, informed both the village board and us that uh, it needed to be corrected. The village board passed it at a prior meeting. Uh, we're, we're passing the same language. Uh, and you have that under uh, new business. Uh, the other item in my director's report was uh, the Gilson Comprehensive Plan. Uh, our consulting team led by Lakota Group partnered with Woodhouse Tanucci Architects, Ewald Hamilton Engineers, and uh, Pizzo and Associates uh, for Ecology um, held stakeholder meetings on January 27th and 28th. Uh, with various groups, including members of our sailing, swimming, and dog beaches, the U.S. Coast Guard, neighbors living along Michigan Avenue, Michigan Shores Club, Go Green Wilmette, the Little Garden Club of Wilmette, and the Wilmette Foundation. We did have uh, a, a slight mix-up on timing with uh, representation from the Wilmette Harbor Association, uh, but we are in process of trying to schedule that for a future date. Uh, all of these stakeholder meetings are in an effort to get as much input as possible with the people who uh, are in very close proximity or heavy users of our uh, crown jewel there at Gilson Park. Uh, and then uh, from that point, we are going to move into on February 18th uh, at 5 p.m. There is a virtual open house. Unfortunately, it's a virtual open house, but we do want to keep this process moving. We do want to hear from the public at large. So the same consulting groups are, are going to do a, a Zoom meeting slightly different than this. They have uh, what's called a panelist format that they're able to do. Uh, and that's how it'll be uh, run with a presentation, some questions, some, some polls uh, for those participating. Uh, we've been taking registration for that and uh, look forward to hearing more from the community on February 18th. After that process uh, takes place with the public input, that's when uh, initial results of, of the input will be uh, generated back to the board uh, and next steps will be taken in the development process of concepts. And that concludes my report. Thank you, any questions for Steve? If not, moving on to the committee reports. Uh, we've got the Lakefront Committee to start. Commissioner Abbott. Hi, uh, yes. Um, we had a meeting uh, last Thursday, um, so just a few days ago. Um, a few things. Uh, first off, with regard, yeah, we have been getting a lot of uh, disc golf uh, emails. Um, that's terrific. Love to see the input from the public. Um, with regard to the master plan, I can uh, only uh, again state that uh, I thought the stakeholder meetings went very well, and in fact, if there's any lessons to be learned uh, from the master plan at Gilson, it's the benefit that we derive from having third parties uh, run these kinds of discussions to the community uh, where they have, no, they have no perceived agenda, I would say perceived agenda, and the public feels mm, completely uh, free to come in and make their comments. Not that they wouldn't, but there's just something really nice about third parties running these stakeholder meetings, although they were very productive. Uh, I encourage, you know, uh, commissioners to take a look at some of those meetings if you're curious. Um, anyway, uh, so February 18th at 5 p.m. public comment. I know it's that this third time, as promised. Uh, I hope the community uh, does respond and does come in. And uh, we'll be talking about Gilson, and we'll be talking about Gilson in the future and what a master plan might include. I don't think there's anything radical, though, but hey, bring your radical ideas if that's what you've got. Um, so public comment, February 18th at 5 p.m. Uh, we talked about the Smith Group and, um, you know, the board has, um, wants to move ahead with some sort of remedial work at uh, Langdon Park in terms of protecting the bluff. Uh, we have gotten a proposal. We've asked for clarification on that proposal. Um, there's some, let's just say, uh, dissatisfaction perhaps with the fees. 
I certainly am guilty of that. Uh, at the amount of the fees, uh, it was Commissioner Sisler's uh, suggestion that uh, we actually have uh, the Smith Group come and talk to the Lakefront Committee in March uh, for our direct questions to them. Um, because if we do not vote to move ahead with the Smith Group, the board may decide to move ahead with uh, opening it up to bid. So uh, before we take such a step, it was Commissioner Sisler's uh, suggestion that we try to do our own due diligence with uh, the Smith Group and perhaps see if we can resolve our issues. Uh, and um, sure, I don't think we're in a big hurry. Uh, water is coming down, fortunately, more rapidly than a seasonal adjustment would indicate. And uh, that's encouraging. Um, Corps of Engineers has just released a six month uh, projection. And the projection is that we would be, uh, perhaps if it holds true, that uh, we would be eight to 10 inches down in July from, uh, from last year's record high. So uh, again, fingers crossed, uh, leaves me at least convinced that we have the time to consider this carefully. So um, our next step there is to talk to the Smith Group in March, March 1st. Um, with regard uh, to uh, the sailing beach, uh, Chris Lewis has uh, come and made his comments. He certainly came and several of us did with regard to uh, fees, uh, new fees at uh, the sailing uh, uh, beach. Um, we talked about that. I think there's a uh, fair agreement with regard to uh, sort of how we got here. Um, we did discuss, I'm just going to kind of go over it quickly. Uh, we discussed in the fall that there would, um, we, our goal was that there would not be uh, district-wide uh, increases. That we'd try to hold the line on both zero fee increases in fees and in uh, salaries. But as we know, there's variations in that. Um, as we went through the budgeting process, we didn't this year. This is it's the only time in my tenure that I've not gotten a fee lit sheet, but expectation was that we weren't raising fees. But as we got into it, uh, we found that uh, there was a, actually fees were, didn't see the numbers, but the fees were going up by 3% uh, at the beach. Uh, I, certainly at the, the Lakefront Committee, uh, by a two to one margin said, yeah, that'd be fine. And it was brought up at the budget meeting. I seem to have lost Commissioner Abbott's feed. Anyone else? Me too. Me too. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make a comment about Smith Group before we open up to the fees discussion, because I think that's important. Mm -hmm. I spent about a decade on the consulting side as a consultant before um, the last decade or so uh, as a client. And I think one of the things that's important with respect to the consultant we've hired after a selection process is understanding what we can do to be a good client and understanding what they can do to help us um, you know, succeed with the project. So I think that's an important next step. And I suggested, and I, I think Commissioner Abbott would support, we should have a, either a committee of the whole or discuss at a board meeting, the lakefront, uh, the Langdon specific um, ideas. I think we all agree that the, the beach is one of our jewels of the park district. And certainly there's a fond spot, spot for Langdon in many of our hearts. And so um, my hope would be that we can discuss as a board and have a uh, you know, broad sharing of ideas with respect to how we will conduct the project. And if I could jump in, you know, because Julia and I are not on that committee, this is sort of our opportunity to speak. I would certainly echo Julia's comments, but, uh, and I would note that I have no experience with shoreline protection, so I don't have a set a good instinct as to what's reasonable and unreasonable. That being said, my initial reaction was that fee seemed very high and I became extremely concerned when Steve uh, shared with the committee that he has asked for more detail, asked for more background, asked for more support, backing up that fee and he hasn't received it at this point. And I hope that we will take a really close look at the fee. Um, I would agree that there was a rigorous process to select Smith Group and my recollection was that there was a near unanimity that they, they were in fact the best group to do this work. And I would certainly echo that. I don't think we want to start all over. On the other hand, this is a tremendous amount of money. And, you know, we as fiduciaries uh, to the taxpayers need to look at this very, very carefully. 
And if we can't get comfortable, I would like to suggest alternatives, like uh, discussing with them about the possibility of uh, doing the work on a time and materials basis with a not to exceed or some other creative approach. Because as I said, I don't have experience here, but that fee really jumped out at me as being something surprising. That's an interesting idea, time and materials, some kind of cost plus model to continue. Uh, Commissioner Abbott has reconnected with us. Yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know where you lost me, but obviously we're talking about the Smith Group. Um, my, I, my suggestion perhaps is to make the uh, the, the uh, March uh, Lakefront Media Committee the whole meeting. I don't at all mind at all, you know, really, seriously, that to allow uh, any commissioners that wish to join the meeting uh, to not only, you know, to be satisfied and get their answers. Um, I like that, Brian. I like that as well. Okay. No, Especially too. given the amount of money that we could possibly be spending. That seems to make sense. So, um, that, uh, President and Vice President, do you, oh, you already said something, Julia. Uh, Amy uh, or Gordon? Yeah. That, okay. All right. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, okay. I don't know where I lost you. I'm sorry. I think it was my, I'm sure, and I know it was like my internet. So I have no idea. What did, what was, where did I disappear into the ether? What was I saying when I- I believe left? you were talking about the sailing beach fees, um, but I'm not certain where you dropped off. Well, your I know, well, I know where I dropped off, but I might've dropped off earlier. That's, uh, that's I guess, my point. Um, well, I will, I'll try to, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, internet and all that. I, usually it's a reliable, Feed, but something about tonight isn't. So uh, we were talking about the sailing fees, and um, again, we'd gone to the board, and there was a three percent. Um, we seem to have ex uh, exceeded that. I think there's pretty well an agreement about that. Some sense. Uh, I've certainly sort of apologized to the community. I didn't realize that we had exceeded that. Uh, I think it's important, and I'm putting this uh, that, that, that this the the lakefront committee has. Uh, again, by two to one vote. Uh, well, we didn't even take a vote, um, but by certainly by an apparent, uh, by obvious two to one margin to um, just go ahead and stand by the fees has been presented to the sailors. Um, you know, the, the board, I think, has a responsibility. Uh, we, we ultimately, we have the, the responsibility uh, and we certainly uh, depend upon staff for so much. Um, and, um, and when we want to honor their uh, input and their expertise and all the things that they do for us. And I could go off on all sorts of reasons why this past summer they were heroes in my mind, but I think we owe it to our sense of responsibility to have a public uh, airing of these fees and and to make sure that we've given people the opportunity. And so if I see them, I know that the public has seen them. Um, and, you know, I, I, the merit of these fees is certainly worth the debate, but I'm, I feel it's not, feel that we shouldn't be discussing them after the fact, we should be discussing them ahead of the fact. I think that's an important uh, principle to, to maintain. I do know we can't possibly review every fee, but we do get the information and we do have an opportunity to discuss it. And um, yeah, the processing fee, I don't know. I just don't, we can talk about the merits of it, but I think it's important to unwind this thing and talk about it, you know, put the, put the, put the horse in front of the cart uh, as, as we have this discussion. So uh, the fees right now, based off the Lakefront Committee, I'm not asking for the, the full board to take any action uh, on this. I have made my statement and my unease with this. And uh, if the board wishes to discuss it, uh, we will do so, we can do so now. Uh, if they don't, I have made my pitch. And I'm seeing if there's anything else. I don't have anything else from the lakefront. So I'm turning it back over to President Anderson. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Abbott. Um, I guess at this point, Steve, we will, the, just so everybody's clear in the audience as well as the board, um, 
you know, we could have done a better job of communication, uh, both internally and externally. And uh, at the end of the day, though, the logic behind it stands. And I think uh, to start peeling it back and trying to redo it and talking about it some more, I think it's just getting into the detail that really the board does not want to and should not get involved with. I, and I understand we should have seen it. Communication should have been better, but I think at the, at the end of the day, we cause more confusion and more heartache opening it up and, and then putting it back in place again, which is the logical end, end result. Uh, but at the same time, all of uh, you know, Commissioner Abbott's comments are, are, are duly noted and, and for the most part supported, I would guess. And if I could just jump in briefly, I mean, I think, you know, we do want to kind of take a look at how we ended up here and, and going back to Gordon's uh, point, take a look at the process and communication. But I think even now, uh, as I understand the issue, that we will still be treating different boat owners of the same classification differently based on how many owners, how many users. And, and again, I don't really want to get into the specifics other than to make a broad statement that I think it makes sense that we treat all boat owners who pay the same fee the same way. And just as sort of a guiding principle, I would like to see us work toward that to the extent that we're not quite there yet. Okay, right. moving so on. may I, can I just make one statement then? I wanna make, I'll make it clear that I wish to see uh, fees. In, my, in the budget discussions, I would like to see the fees. Um, and uh, that's all, I, and I think I have the right to see them. And I just wanna see them uh, in the future. I'm making, I'm making a clear request, uh, an ambiguous request, so. Yep. And, and right. that's normally something we would see in the committee level for sure um, as part of the budget process. Are you Normally talking about seeing have. the exact fees? Because I don't think we've ever seen that. We've just seen a generalized, uh, it seems to have been more a generalized, you know, where we're raising fees by, you know, a certain percentage or we're not raising them or we're going to lower them. Not, not each, you know, the, the actual fee that's charged for each activity. Is, is that what you're saying? You want to see each fee for activity? As we, I have, as I have seen every year up until two, 2020, I have seen a spreadsheet of fees and what their each fee will be raised um, uh, down at the lakefront and, and at the pool and in all locations. We have always been and that's from there the budgets get built. So I, I actually have to correct you that we do. Because I, I didn't see that last, not never mind 2020. I didn't see it 2019. I don't remember seeing anything like that. Cecilia, if I could jump in, I think at least for the pool, when you and I were on the Parks and Rec Committee, they did provide that information to us. I don't recall the specifically what we've done in every area, but I okay, know that okay. a year ago we did that for the pool anyway. We've had lots of discussions over the years of every year about the, well, how much we're raising the daily rate, yeah. the yearly yeah. rate, how much we're raising the, the kayak rates and the uh, uh, and these are I'm very sensitive to them, and I think that um, you know we this, this transparency I think is important. And and yes, we do get that information, and I would like to see it. I'm making a very like I said a clear, unambiguous request to see that information. And, and Steve, I'll just let you chime in. Is, is that a? I mean, we've seen it every other year other than 2020. Is and you can't do the budget without going through that yourselves. So there's no reason why it couldn't be shared with the committee members uh, when they're reviewing the budgets, um, I would guess. So if you could just confirm that, that would be great. Yeah, that's no yeah. problem. Uh, historically, uh, and I wouldn't even say it's happened every year, but in a lot of years for sure, uh, for the facilities themselves, uh, there have been fee charts for daily admissions, uh, memberships, things like that. Obviously, when you start talking about all the camps and all the programs, then that becomes uh, too much. Uh, but we do call out where we deviate from the budgetary guidance that is set at the beginning of the, of the process. So uh, we can definitely get back into that habit of, of getting those uh, spreadsheets together and sharing them with the committees. Great, I mean, this year was an unusual year. I mean, or 2020 was an unusual year. 
So <laughs> a lot of passes there. Okay, moving on to uh, Commissioner Murdoch, Parks and Rec. All right, Parks and Rec met earlier this evening, and as we have been doing for um, several months, we spent a fair amount of time talking about the community play fields. So um, the staff was able to give us some additional information concerning possible path configurations and some costs and possible bathroom locations. And uh, this has been a, a very long process, but uh, we're trying to put as much information out there to balance the needs of the folks who live close to the park, who are very passionate about um, what we're doing with the needs of the community as a whole. So with respect to the, the path, um, staff has come up with what I think is a very creative configuration where uh, there would be three loops. One would be effectively a half mile loop, one would be a three quarter mile loop, and one would be a mile long loop. Um, I think the committee has indicated a, um, uh, and, and those are approximate, I'm not sure if they are exact, but I think the committee has shared with uh, the staff that our ideal goal would be to have a mile long loop for a lot of different reasons. The challenge we've had with that is it appears there is no way to do a mile long loop of an entirely soft cinder path um, while still not damaging the root system of the cottonwoods and not being so close to the past field configuration that it might create a safety concern for participants. So we did ask staff to kind of look one more time and see if there's something we can do there. But I think there's a tremendous amount of flexibility here and gives us some really great options. And it's my hope that at the March Parks and Rec meeting, we will be able to make a recommendation um, to the full board with respect to uh, a fitness path. In addition, we've taken a look at bathroom configurations and historically there were four uh, potential locations. And you know, based on some feedback from my fellow commissioners, we asked staff to do a little bit more work. We wanted to see if it, were, if it would be possible to have bathrooms um, south of the path, the main path as opposed to north, look at other alternatives, look at some hybrids. And I think staff came back with actually nine different potential locations now. Um, and uh, so we looked at all the costs associated with that. And uh, again, I, it's my expectation that at the next Parks and Rec meeting, we will either make a recommendation for one specific location or whether we want to defer that decision based on uh, potentially having uh, bathrooms at District 39. Uh, it's my understanding that staff gave us an update that we've had very fruitful conversations with District 39, that it appears that they will be open to providing some access in some form for the bathrooms that are attached to the junior high but are not open to the inside of the junior high, but also with some restrictions. And so as we you know, gather that information, um, again, it's my hope that at the next meeting, we as a committee will be prepared to make a recommendation to the full board. Um, we then also discussed um, uh, potential dog park locations. Um, as I think everyone is aware, we've had just one location in the east part of the village, um, and there is a desire to have a location in the center part of the village and a west part of the village. Um, we have for some years, some time, been planning to do a dog park um, in West Park or actually west of West Park underneath the, uh, um, the old right of way and the power lines. Uh, but that is actually Glenview property, not Wilmette property, even though it's adjacent to our properties. And I know staff's been working through that process with Glenview. And there's, I think it's our expectation that we will be able to um, offer something over there, but we're still going through the regulatory process with them. So our conversations have focused on trying to find a center of village location. And a couple of meetings ago, we looked at multiple locations and narrowed it down to uh, Mallinckrodt and Howard Park. And then this meeting, we looked at a couple of specific configurations at those two parks. Coming out of that meeting today, the Howard Park location was perceived as perhaps being a little small. So staff is exploring whether we can expand the proposed location to the south because there is a parking lot that is past its useful life that would need to be reconfigured or redone. And uh, staff's had conversations with the village about potentially providing some parking in alternative ways to make that dog park larger. In addition, um, uh, we have a proposed location for a Mallinckrodt dog park that would be a fenced in area in the middle of the park. 
And I have raised some concerns about that in terms of how Malincrat is currently used and asked staff to look at whether there are other locations within Malincrat Park. And I just wanna ask Steve to pull up that map so anyone watching this meeting is aware what's on the table right now. And, and again, I expect that we will be making a recommendation to the full board at the next Park and Rec meeting. So Steve, is it possible to pull that up? I think uh, Superintendent Solberg has it. Great. So um, as of now, the Mallinckrodt location we're considering is that area shown in yellow um, that would be a fenced in area. I assume a dog park fence would generally be, is it a four foot fence? Is it a six foot fence? Is it a, anybody have any information about that? Just so everyone knows what we're talking about. It's four, five or six. The preference is by most people who use dog parks, the higher the fence, the better because then risk of dogs jumping out. Um, but we could be four or five feet. Got it. Okay. Um, and uh, so thank you for pulling that up. So again, it's my expectation that the committee will make a recommendation to the full board at the next meeting. Um, so it sounds like there will be one or two potential Howard Park configurations and there will be, you know, one or two uh, potential Mallinckrodt locations. Um, we, uh, um, we briefly touched on the, um, the notion again of doing sort of a system wide um, uh, needs and use assessment. And I would just uh, mention that I think in the context of Frisbee golf, it might make sense um, that we do something like this. I certainly hear that, uh, um, that Isaac spoke earlier that he believes that the best location is, um, is at the lakefront, which is obviously a different committee. That being said, I've always tried to follow a process, whether it was for paddle tennis or a dog park or um, whatever the case may be, to kind of look at the entire system and then focus in a little bit. I personally, with respect to um, um, disc golf, and, and I'm getting off on a tangent a little bit, I don't know how much space we need, what amenities, what other communities are doing. I would love to see that. And I guess I would ask President Anderson if, you know, how we should go about evaluating that before we hone on a potential location, especially as we're, we're talking about the, uh, the master plan for Gilson. It seems a little premature to put that in there. On the other hand, if that is ultimately the ideal location, I would have concerns about a master plan that doesn't factor that in. Um, so, uh, and then in addition, we, uh, um, we had staff reports just very briefly. Um, we've moved from tier three to two, tier four, and that's uh, allowed us to expand some of our programming offerings. I think uh, Jason's quote, and I loved it, so I'm going to repeat it, is paddle has gone crazy. And I would certainly echo that. I think he said that our lesson revenue is up 132% um, and that we now have the hut um, partially open. We also are allowed to have some competitive hockey um, I think Emily had mentioned that our gymnastics classes are bursting at the seams and we have 700 people now participating and uh, we had 2,500 visits to center fitness, which is back open at 50% of capacity. Um, and uh, Carol had mentioned that we had a thousand winter enrollments. We had about 155 basketball clinic participants, even though we don't have basketball leagues this year, we're trying to offer some, uh, um, some opportunities for folks. And our student plays because we've moved from three to four, which we're going to be virtual, not virtual are now allowed to have some smaller amount of audiences. And that is the Parks and Rec report, unless anyone has any questions. Uh, All right, next uh, is the Golf well, Operations Committee. I have some questions. Okay. I do have, I have some comments, questions, I guess. Uh, so, uh, my, so uh, the dog park uh, options, I, I, I was particularly interested in those. Um, you know, most of you know, Malincrot's where I start my morning every morning. I see a lot of dogs in Malincrot. I think that I'm not wild about taking that middle section. Uh, certainly the dogs that go off leash and I don't try to police people's dogs. Uh, do so along the west fence, sometimes along the south fence, which is the south fence is like an eight foot tall solid masonry wall. Uh, so, you know, the, the houses are kind of pretty well walled off in the park. 
the west a fence over there is a wrought iron fence, but it's a it's green on the other side. Those are the areas where the dogs already run if they get taken off a leash. Not that they're supposed to, but they kind of already do, and they're not blocking up the middle. I'm not wild about that middle of Malincrot being fenced off. I think that would really be detrimental to the feel of the park. So if it were to go in the Malincrot, I could see myself supporting a dog park along the edges, but I would not support one in the middle. Howard Park seems to be very, uh, I don't think you need one in both, and uh, uh, that seems attractive. Um, although that's also kind of a potential location for disc golf. So, um, you know, uh, you guys are doing a good job. I just wanted to make you aware of, you know, I can't comment in the meeting, so I'm going to comment here. Uh, that's my feeling on those. I do, I'm supportive of a dog park in the middle of the community and the dog park on the west end of the community. This is a dog town. Um, notwithstanding how many people get permits, there's a lot of dogs. Uh, and I think that our uh, feline friends and their owners uh, would greatly appreciate having their puppies be allowed to do a little bit of running uh, and do so legally. So, yeah, Brian, if question. I could jump in on that, a couple of things. I don't think we're contemplating two locations in the middle of town, so it would be an either or situation. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I and, agree. And, uh, you know, in terms of the location at Malincrot, um, you know, again, I think my preference would be along that southern end as well, but I think uh, Amy may have mentioned that that would put it closer to people's homes and there's a concern about impacting folks. So, you know, there's some balancing act with this, but especially if we're considering, a, um, you know, a four or five or even a six foot fence, yeah, I would have a lot of concerns about fencing the middle of the park. Um, that, you know, my hope is that I think what was attractive about that, and I don't want to speak for the other commissioners, but was the notion that, uh, um, that we could have a larger area and maybe we can have the best of both worlds by finding a way to expand the Howard Park location. So I'll let other people jump in on that. But before I do, somebody at our last meeting, it may have been Walter mentioned that uh, uh, there were only 400 dog tags for the, the beach. Uh, but as you had said, we have hundreds, probably thousands of dogs around town. And uh, just thousands. because someone doesn't, uh, buy a pass to the dog beach doesn't mean they wouldn't like to have a dog park someplace in town. So we really do want to expand our offerings. We'd like to have locations east, middle, and west, and I'm confident we're going to be able to get to that point. Two points. Uh, the wall on the south end of Malincrod is like an eight-foot old masonry wall. It was there for uh, the convent put that wall in. Not uh, We didn't build that. Uh, so it's really walled off. Um, but, you know, I like Howard Park. Look, I just don't like the one in the middle of the park. I guess that's it. I don't have any strong opinions otherwise. And uh, with regard to how many dogs are in this town, uh, when you have 10,000 households, pick a percentage. Uh, but it's going to be thousands and thousands of households who have uh, dogs that are a member of their family and should get some exercise. And we're in the exercise business. I'm good with this. So, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm smiling right, because... Any other or comments? Thanks. Dog parks are a hot topic. Dogs have had their best year thanks to the quarantine. And so um, I'd be curious. <laughs> they really have. Someday we'll all go oh. back to work or travel and they'll be really surprised, but they're having their best moments. And um, it occurs to me that there are probably some data points that'll help us just get a quick assessment of how many dogs are in Wilmette. And one would be the you know, Cook County rabies registration. I think also that there's an opportunity to register your dog with the village. So. There are people who would use, um, you know, perhaps the, the beach and, and, and pay the fee. I thought that was helpful that that was raised in the prior conversation by a member of the community, but there's probably a few other ways we could triangulate. Um, in any case, it's a good thing we're discussing it because I, I'm pretty fair, I'm fairly certain that the Venn diagram of parks people and dog people have some level of overlap. So I'm looking forward to seeing where this goes. I was gonna add, I mean, you know, the people who have come to us and requested Howard Park to be a dog park, don't go to the dog beach. So they're, you know, they are not included in that. That that's why they want Howard Park because they don't want to go to, you know, it's it, it's it is a fair distance for some people to travel in this town, and I think they would. Prefer. Um, so I don't think you can just go by the number of uh, uh, of dog beach permits. I think there are a lot more people who would use it than than there. Yeah, I don't want to speak for the rest of the commissioners, but I, my sense is that there's broad support among all of us 
to expand our offer our offerings and I'm confident we'll be able to do that. And again, just from a process standpoint, we actually looked at every park in the system and tried to identify potentials. We then whittled it down to these two. Now we're tweaking them and, and hopefully we'll be in a position next month to make that recommendation. And, and I expect it'll be very favorably received by the board. Thank you. Mike, I think the, the committee and the board are asking all the right questions and I feel like we're zeroing in on it pretty well. Um, just a, a general question, is the assumption that we will also be charging people to use those dog parks like we are down at um, Gilson or will it be kind of one for the whole community uh, or, or how, do, how do we think? It's great. I think it's great. We're going to pull the dogs that are running around loose and get them mostly into a defined area that is under control so you don't have issues with you know dog poop all over places where the kids are playing and you know messing up the rest of the park so um, but what are your thoughts on that? Yeah that's a great question and staff hasn't weighed in yet on any sort of a fee structure and whether there would be a fee. Uh, we will ask staff next month to make a recommendation and you know my my initial reaction is I would probably defer to staff on that but I'd like to hear um, what what staff believes, what uh, the community feels, and what the other commissioners feel. I'm open either way. Well, I, I kind of feel that the reason, like for for the um, dog beach tag, that we have it permitted and dogs have a tag, is to make sure that the dogs are um, see a vet every year and have proper inoculations that they are protected from disease. So I assume that would also apply to any other dog park we had. So that we would, in a sense want there to be a fee to make people take that seriously. Um, see yeah, and I'll jump, I'll jump in real quick to, to Commissioner Clark's point. I believe Mr. Keats pointed it out in the last uh, Parks and Recreation Committee earlier tonight. Uh, it, the county is uh, responsible for regulating all dog parks within the county, and, and they have a lot of requirements to make sure all shots are in place and all of that. So we would absolutely have to have uh, some sort of process to review all of that. And I think the best way to do that is some sort of permit. Uh, the fees associated with it, we can look at that. We can bring a recommendation forward. I think uh, you want to have some flexibility built into that because not everyone is comfortable with uh, the, the beach because it isn't fully enclosed because of the water. Uh, I know my dog, when I had a dog, was a runner. Uh, so that would not have been an option for us, but something fully fenced in uh, would have definitely been something we would have been interested in. So you wanna make options for people to kind of pick the best solution for them. So we can, we can come up with uh, some suggestions for a future meeting. I, Thank you. Uh, I would just uh, add as much as I uh, agree completely with the idea that we need uh, registration, we need compliance. Um, just want to make sure that any fees that we pr propose, uh, let's, let's not make the bar too high. Uh, so let's make sure that we uh, get compliance by not trying to turn this into a big revenue stream so much as, you know, we're looking out for the dogs and each other's uh, safety here. So I'm not looking at it like, oh, we can pick up some money here. Uh, but the dog beach fee for residents is very very reasonable it's it's it really is not barred anyone and i, I would assume it'd be the same i defer to your experience in that okay anything else with uh parks and rec or the dog par uh, park so we'll move on to golf well, operations commissioner wolf Yes, the golf committee met on January 25th and we had staff give us some updates. Um, at the time, it was prior to our latest large snow and they were getting ready to groom for cross country skiing. Um, my understanding is that has been done since we have a ton of snow and that it's being used um, continually, which is great. So if you haven't gotten out there, go check out the cross country skiing trail that um, is at the golf course. Um, in addition, the staff is making plans for this upcoming season. The memberships will look similar to what they did this past year. Um, they'll still offer options of single rider carts. That was something that was pretty popular this year, so they'll still have that as well. Memberships are currently for sale. Um, the restaurant is, was set to reopen to 25% as we moved into this new, new tier. I'm, I'm assuming since our meeting that it has reopened. I'm saying yes. So the restaurant is reopened if anyone would like to get out and have a nice meal out at the golf course. That's an opportunity to, to do that now. 
Um, in addition, we had two staff members that had left the golf course for other opportunities. So staff was busy um, looking at uh, resumes and things like that, trying to hire uh, two more people to fill those positions. And I don't believe they've been quite filled, but they're in the process of doing that. Uh, in addition, the course uh, prior to the snow had been all dressed and sealed away for winter. So it was, it's all snug underneath the snow getting all dormant and it will be ready to go when the spring comes back around. And then finally, we discussed the golf cart path project. Uh, staff reported that Unfortunately, our initial expectations were not met by our contractor. We were hoping to get some more work done prior to winters coming in and that didn't quite happen because of the contractor not having enough crews um, that time of the year for, for some reason. Um, so it's, we're hoping to complete the project by the end of April. Uh, if not, there are some penalties that are in place for the contractor if it's not completed by the end of May. So we're, we're, we're hopeful that it will get taken in time, done in time for the season to really start up after Memorial Day. The one part of the project that has been completed is the drainage part. So that um, was supposed to be completed before the year end. So that's kind of the golf course. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, I've gotten comments from skiers and the course has been groomed and they're, they're out there every day. And I really like it. Thank you. Yes, thanks. I think given COVID, people are looking for outdoor activities and I'm, I'm just so glad that we can offer something else for people to be you know, socially distant and safe and, and enjoying one of our, our lovely amenities at a time that it's not normally used. So I'm very glad that we have that. And I've got some more uh, scouts uh, who are looking into maybe coming out there and using the course as well. So they're looking into rentals. Excellent. I, I see you caught yourself there, Brian. I, what did I do? I think you caught yourself. You, you were going to say Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts, I know, I know, <laughs> I know. Well, we've been co-ed for 20 years, but yes, yeah. yes, yeah. Scouts. Very hey, good. Come on. All righty. Thank Next you. Up. Thanks, Amy. Next up is the Financial Planning and Policy Committee, uh, Commissioner Goble. Yes. Hi, everyone. We met on Tuesday, January 19th and uh, discussed several items um, on, a, on an annual basis. So we did not meet in December. So January was our first opportunity to come back together. Um, we reviewed um, the unaudited revenue and expense statements. Those are in your packet today, um, as well as capital expense results. And um, I think as it's been stated many times last year was an unusual year. Um, but given the various puts and takes, as well as measures that were um, implemented throughout the year. Um, the, uh, it does appear that we are roughly where we forecasted um, to end at the year. So much more detail in the documents. And then of course, we're kicking off the audit process that will be led by Superintendent Foy and our outside auditors. And so that, um, that process takes us typically um, you know, several months into the year. Uh, we are in the upcoming meeting on February 16th going to be continuing the important work on some of our policy planning and changes with respect to our vision to be a more diverse, uh, equitable, and inclusive park district. Um, a statement was adopted several months ago, as many of you know, and now you know the work continues because beyond the statement is really about how we take those items to life. Um, so we'll be discussing that in upcoming in the upcoming meeting on uh, Tuesday. But I want to share that um, the staff has been looking at this in a I, I feel a really thoughtful way in a really thorough way in that they've taken the opportunity to have small group meetings to um, discuss in um, in groups that are inclusive of multiple ethnicities and you know with an eye to increase diversity in a number of ways um, in particular our hiring practices and um, in, in past meetings there have been discussions of open houses at various high schools I think there are uh, there are wealth of opportunities to take advantage of those um, not only uh, events that occur at local high schools, um, but also um, community colleges, Oakton and others. And some of those are even virtual, which makes it a little bit easier to do some recruiting that way. But um, beyond the, you know, the statements and the policies are moving uh, those ideas into action. So I'm very excited to have an opportunity to learn more about the staff's efforts thus far and then put that into process uh, as time goes on. And then the only other item I wanted to note is one I mentioned when we were in the earlier part of the meeting talking about the voucher list. Um, I know that um, those of 
you who've been watching this, uh, the board meetings for some time know that the voucher list is a standard part and it has quite a lot of detail about the various number of items that are involved in the annual, or excuse me, the monthly operations. And the one that almost always catches eyes is the P card uh, line item, which is the sum of all of our purchasing on uh, essentially a corporate chase card. And um, that gives uh, the, the park district some opportunities in return if, with respect to rebates, which is helpful. We, I, I think we all group our points um, on our personal credit cards, but um, it also creates a little bit of opaqueness in terms of what those different items are. And Superintendent Foy is um, looking at a few different ways um, that some more visibility could be brought to the categories that are embedded under that P card number. So um, looking forward to, to how some, um, you know, just different ways of explaining the data can be there. Um, to make that a little bit more meaningful of a, of a document. So those are some of the things that are happening in the financial planning and policy committee. Um, and uh, again, we're meeting next Tuesday and then we'll return to our regular Mondays uh, in March. Any questions for Commissioner Goble? I have a few questions and comments. I guess I would like to start by um, applauding the efforts to update our inclusion policies. And, and again, I think it's critical that these aren't just words on a page. And uh, um, you know, at Parks and Rec, I think we always uh, get updates about our hiring progress and, and practices. And so we'll certainly be following up with that as well. So again, thank you, Julia, for spearheading that. I think it's very important. I think it's important that I know that we've talked a little bit about it, but when we take a look at our year-end financials, I think everybody's pleased that we ended up showing a small surplus um, but I think it's important to highlight the fact that the reason we showed a surplus was because we took in some, um, some funds from a debt issuance for the cart path project that weren't fully extend, expended. So on the one hand, we ended up slightly in the black, if you will, in 2020, but we start 2021 in a whole. And again, I guess I would just really encourage everybody to not be so fixated, not that we are, but just moving forward about whether we're in a sort of a a positive negative situation um, year to year. I mean, obviously these have been extraordinary well times. That's well said. And, uh, and, uh, um, and then finally, just uh, because again, I wasn't allowed to uh, bring anything up at the uh, financial planning meeting as we took a look at our capital spending from last year, I personally was alarmed that uh, one of our projects was so far over budget, you know, the CRC um, roof building B uh, project I think we had budgeted 420,000 and it was reported that we were 188,000 over budget. It's my understanding that uh, um, part of the reason for that was we had some spending on the prior project that came into this year. This is a multi-year project, but I think it's really critical for all of us in, in our oversight role to really take a look at our spending, especially on these types of projects. And so to that end, Steve, I'm hoping you can give us some information because it's my understanding the project was still over budget I'd like to know how much over budget it was and the reason for that. We don't necessarily have to do that today. I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but it's really important to me to understand these things and to track these things. Absolutely. I think that's good. Right and I just had a quick the financial planning committee to, uh, and have it all detailed there. Yeah, and I think too, the, the thing I noted was a, a difference between the actual spend and the projected spend. So it appears to me that between the budget and then um, as the year went on, that adjusted. I, I think one thing I want to know, which, which would be helpful for each of us, is as you know, whether we're homeowners or business owners, we know that it's not unusual for pre-existing conditions to um, change the landscape on the ground when the project is underway. So that may be the case here, but I will look forward to hearing more feedback. Um, I, I expect at some point you have to make decisions on the ground and, and uh, you know, to, to carry out projects, but I look forward to seeing what you have to share. And I would agree. And thank you for your both your comments and your questions, Mike. Um, yeah, we are starting this year, really, 2021, about actually kind of it's a phantom 600,000 in the hole uh, that slipped over the line from 2020 to 2021. Uh, nothing wrong with that. It's just that the board needs to keep that in mind. That, uh, projections already got hit uh, by that amount for 21. That's all. Yeah, timing, timing. That was all timing, absolutely. <clears throat> okay. Moving on, uh, next item is unfinished business. Anything anybody's got? Well, 
one, two, three, hearing none. Moving on to new business. And we're sort of looking back uh, to item six from uh, uh, Steve's uh, executive director report. Uh, we're going to um, consider resolution 2021-R-1 uh, related to sort of essentially fixing the, uh, um, the uh, um, stormwater agreement, the IGA with the village. Um, I, anybody want to make that motion or? Like I'll make the motion. Okay, thanks, Todd. Go ahead. Oh, no, read oh, you, you, oh read I'm it sorry. <laughs> I'll make the motion. It's a, it's a long yeah, one. It's a long one. didn't memorize it, I'm sure. Uh, I'll make the motion uh, considering a consideration of resolution 2021. Uh, dash R dash one, a resolution approving your first amendment to the intergovernmental agreement between the Wilmette Park District and the village of Wilmette for the construction, operation and maintenance of a series of underground stormwater reservoirs and other ancillary improvements in portions of community playfields, Hibbard Park and Thornwood Park. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, uh, can we get a second? I'll second. All right, any, any discussion after Steve explained it earlier? I appreciate this housekeeping. I, uh, this is yeah. a sign of good cooperation. I guess, yeah, I, I do have a couple of comments. One, I think any chance we get, it's good to highlight the fact that this has been a model of cooperation between two units of government. And by working together, um, I think we've been able to provide the same level of protection as another plan that would have cost you know, upwards of $30 million um, to the taxpayers. So again, I think we all should collectively be pleased about this. But I think as we as we pass this amendment, we should also recognize that uh, uh, there was a time in the relatively distant past where the park district and the village did not get along so well together. And uh, we are far, far from that period, but we should all be aware and be concerned that we did sign an agreement where there was an oversight, for lack of a better word. And um, I think we've all probably been in situations, whether it was a purchase of a home or whatever, where we've entered into a contract and uh, there was something that wasn't quite expected. Well, we're generally bound by that contract. So we're fortunate to have good partners with the village. They recognize that the document didn't reflect the agreements. And uh, so it's being corrected now, but we should always be, all of us collectively, myself included, should really be very careful that we catch these kinds of things in the future so we don't you know, have to rely on sort of the good nature of another party. And with that, I will certainly support the, uh, um, the motion. Thank you. And, and fortunately, we all serve the same masters, which is a, a tax paying residents of Wilmette. So uh, thank you. All right. Um, at this point, um, do you want to take a vote, Steve? Commissioner Abbott? Yes. Commissioner Murdoch? Yes. Commissioner Schistler? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Wolf? Yes. Commissioner Goble? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Resolution is approved. Okay, well at this point uh, we're going to adjourn to a closed session. Steve, do I need to read the reasoning why or is it just yes. refer back? Okay, all right. Um, we're going to uh, move to adjourn to closed session to discuss minutes of meetings lawfully closed whether for purposes of approval by the body of the minutes or semi-annual review of the minutes and the appointment, em employment, compensation, discipline, performance or dismissal of specific employees of the public body or legal counsel of the district, including hearing testimony on a complaint lodged against an employee of the district or against legal counsel to determine its validity in accordance with sections 2C1 and 21 of the Open Meetings Act. A lot of words there, but essentially we're moving to close meeting for a typical meeting we have this year every time. Uh, I need a second. Can I get a second? Second. Thank you. Second. And, uh, All right. Call vote. Commissioner Abbott? Go. Yes. Commissioner Murdoch? Yes. Commissioner Schisler? Yes. Commissioner Clark? Yes. Commissioner Wolf? Yes. Commissioner Goble? Yes. And Commissioner Anderson? Yes. All right, at this time, we're gonna go into closed session. If you are 
uh, not a board member, or uh, I guess if you're not a board member, uh, time to either click out of the meeting. And if you don't click out of the meeting, I'll move you into the waiting room and bring you back in when uh, the closed session is over. YouTube Live, you can click out of the meeting. And Steve, you might mention to people that if we, when we come back, nothing really happens. So people may not want to stick around. Absolutely. And, and we don't know how long the meeting's going to take. So it could yeah, be a while. Absolutely. So they're dropping out pretty quickly. <laughs> Can't blame right, we, oh, And now it's just this crew. So I'm going to stop the recording.